from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Um, welcome. This is the final lecture of our 2017 NASA Goddard series, and we already have eight planned for next year, which will be our 12th year. We don't have the date set yet, but we've got some exciting things on the horizon. But today, um, I want to welcome you, and I'm glad that you didn't go to the Zumba party. You came here to, <laughs> to expand your minds. Um, I'm Stephanie Marcus from the Science, Technology, and Business Division, and uh, I guess I already said what I wanted to say. Anyway, um, I was thinking back to how when I was a little kid, we used to drive around in December and see all the holiday light displays, and a lot of this was before NASA was even created, but I never imagined that I'd be standing next to a scientist who can see all of the holiday lights or any surges in lighting across the globe from space. So it's really, we've come an awfully, awful long way. Um, today our speaker is Miguel Roman, and he was born in Puerto Rico. He is from a very large family, and his uncle was an electrical engineer there, and that inspired him to do that instead of whatever else he might be able to do on the island. But when he was still in college, he got a <coughs> fellowship to NASA and was assigned to an Earth scientist and was absolutely hooked on science and NASA. So he's ended up there in 2009. Before that, he went to Cornell and got a master's in systems engineering and then a PhD at Boston University in remote sensing. Um, his team, some of them are here today, so <laughs> <laughs> that's a, a great to have the support group. And he will be telling us how they go about creating these maps. You got a map out there that's hot off the press. I guess he picked them up Monday, so it's the latest images. And he will tell us how they do that and I think it's not all holiday things because there are a lot of places where the lights have dimmed or gone out due to poverty, war, and hurricanes recently. So please help me welcome Miguel Roman to the library. Thank you. The work that we do at NASA as, as defined in the initial space space agreement is to explore the Earth and understand uh, the Earth as a system. And that provides NASA with a lot of flexibility to understand a lot of different components that uh, gives us a holistic view of the Earth from space. And the idea here is that we want to use space as a means to understand all these different components, the land, the ocean, the atmosphere, the ice, and how we as humans are also making an impact and, and human activities percolate through and are to the Earth system. The challenge with Earth system science is that we always try to find what happens when a small disturbance in any of these subsystems can affect the entire planet as a whole. Think of it, for instance, what happens if, you know, we release too much CO2 in the atmosphere, the planet begins to heat, the ocean becomes acidic. You know, these are questions that are really difficult to answer with just a few measurements here and there. NASA, for the last 45 years or so, we've tried to tackle the problem of Earth system understanding by doing the following, which is we, we launch satellites. Um, we use these engineering marvels, these 5,000 pound school bus sized satellites, and in them we carry these instruments, and e each of these instruments have a purpose. They have a mission to understand the different components. One of them could measure the Earth's radiation budget. The other one could measure aerosols. The other one could measure um, images, which then we can then directly relate to some activity patterns taking place at the surface. Our emphasis is to use the unique vantage point of space to understand how the Earth is changing. This is the 
This image is known as the blue marble. Today is the 45th anniversary uh, from the time the Apollo 17 astronaut took this picture 14,000 miles away in their way to go into the moon. December 8, 1970-something. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, can't do that math. There you go. 70. And so how do you become an inter-system scientist? It's not like... You know, you grow up in Puerto Rico and you say, Abuela, <laughs> I want to be an assistant scientist. No, it's not. Well, I, to answer that question, I, I need to take you on a quick tour over the land where I grew up, which is Puerto Rico. As Steph was saying, I come in from a very, very large family. This is, this is a picture from our grandparents' um, 50th anniversary back in 1988. The family has grown exponentially since then. Now we have 21 cousins, and most of them, and a lot of extended family, they all live in Puerto Rico. Um, and here we used to go on trips. You know, we don't have Six Flags or Disney in Puerto Rico. We have the Arecibo Observatory. We could go out cruising around La Parguera here. This is my, my here right me, and this is my brother, Jonathan, who's now a doctor. He, he's an internist in, in Bayamon. And that's my mom. And another thing that you're always being told is to appreciate nature, because that's really what all we have in the island. And it's, it's free. It's just like the Library of Congress. It's free. <laughs> and that you also need to respect nature, because nature has a way to correct itself. And for the maladies of man, this is, this is La Parguera. And you can see the docks here. This is where my mom is staying, uh, standing right there. And this is La Parguera after Maria, um, just, if, just 60, 60 days ago. And I'm going to be talking about Maria later in my talk, but I just wanted to give you a sense of what drove me to, to NASA, which is that, you know, when you witness change and it impacts your communities, um, that's, that's quite a telling story. This is Puerto Rican astronaut Joe Acaba, who's currently orbiting the International Space Station, and he took this image of Puerto Rico. And although it's a little bright here, you can start seeing a lot of the defoliation, uh, particularly around flooded areas, all the rivers, all, all that, those areas in brown. Another thing that we are really well known in Puerto Rico is our hot blood, our music, our, the fact that we see ourselves as a community, not in terms of material aspects, but we see ourselves as part of a larger culture that contributes a lot to the world in many different ways. And, and that includes things like music, our food, the way we celebrate Christmas. We celebrate Christmas, like the lar longest Christmas in duration. We, folks here to f finish up their holidays in January 1st, I was like, what? <laughs> but where's the Three Kings Festival? And the Octavitas and the San Sebastian Festival. Yeah, we go through up to January 20. The lights remain until January 20. And what I try to impress upon you is that all these things really matter in terms of understanding how humanity interacts with the environment around us. Because every time we do this, we're consuming energy. And so that kind of led to my um, trying to really tackle one of the biggest challenges that we have at NASA in the scope of understanding humanity's role in the Earth system. And that, in, in, that started with, um, I, I'm very data oriented, and you'll see that very, cl very clearly in my, in my slides, but the idea of tackling the massive amount of information, this may sound familiar, and volumes of information that we got and try to make sense of it. That's the challenge that we are going through today. And so, Every time there's an opportunity for us to talk and say, look, at least here's a snapshot of what we've learned. I think that's important. And so I want to take you back 45 years ago of what we have done. This is an image of, of Las Vegas in 1972 when the first land imaging satellite was launched by NASA. And for 45 years, we've been collecting images every 16 days over the entire world and its land system. I want you to notice the variation in water in Lake Mead, because as a city becomes more intense and more urbanized, you need more water, you need more resources, you are replacing the natural ecosystem with 
urban built up. And you can definitely see the effects that humanity has had by just looking at these long term measurements from space. And that's one of the values of Earth system science from the vantage view of space, which is that if you collect data for very long periods of time, that is as valuable as having a nice core and understanding past warming, because it gives you a really good picture of what's going on. Humanity's footprint um, in the Earth system can also be seen in the atmosphere. This is an image composite of for of uh, the concentration of nitrogen and dioxide is taken from the ozone mapping instrument, an instrument that is well known f uh, for helping us track the reduction of ozone depletion in the South Pole. We've managed through the Montreal Protocol to reduce the ozone hole, meaning that humans can actually alter the Earth for the benefit of future generations. This is a different type of gas. This is an ozone. This is uh, nitrogen dioxide. It's a short-leaf gas which means that it quickly combines with other molecules like water to form acid rain, to form the kind of pollutants that impact air quality and result in large cases of childhood asthma. EPA has a full monitoring program on, and on NOx and SOx and all different types of molecules. And what you'll see here is that the concentration really trails the weekly pattern that humans take in terms of routines within the city. You can see that by Sunday, when everybody's at church and at Wegmans, you know, having brunch with their kids because you don't want to have breakfast and you just go to Wegmans. Sorry. <laughs> you, you see that the concentration goes down. And you, now, if you, if you did this on a weekly basis and on a recurring basis, you begin to see patterns in the data that can give you some information about the extent of contamination, but also how that contamination is directly led to, to an actual pattern of energy use. And as you'll see, this is the introduction to what we call the black marble. And the posters that you'll find at, at the front, these are the first ever, this is the first release of those posters. And Gavin has one of them here. And you might have seen these posters already. Um, we've been generating them on an annual basis for al almost 20 years now. The, the importance, what, I, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to quickly go through how we actually extract a map of annual night lights. So you can have, get a sense of not just the massive amount of data, but have a context of what you're seeing here. What does it mean that I see a bright pixel here? Is that my house? Is that a city? Well, let's go through that quickly. This is, this is the city of example in Barcelona. And as you can see here, the entire area is brighted. And if you can catch at least one little blimpy pixel, then really in terms of size, what we're talking about is a 700 square kilometer, square meter area. So it's roughly a three block by three block area. Every pixel that you see is about that size. That doesn't mean that we can't detect a small light emission in, within that area. In fact, we've conducted experiments in Puerto Rico and we use flashlights like these and we we, take a, we go all the way to a very dark spot here. This is the Pitaya far farmland site in Cabo Rojo. And we brighten up this tarp with 12,000 lumens of light. And we can see it from space. So it, it means that you have this, what we call in geography, the support. But inside that support, there is a target. And we can detect it. Just the same way we can detect fires from space. It doesn't mean that I know the location of a fire. I know that that fire is inside that one kilometer area. The holy grail of remote sensing, the study of satellite images from space, is to be able to detect the location of that lamp and the intensity of that energy output. That's, that's really the technical hurdle. And it's quite a hurdle um, because the data that we get directly from the satellite is not a pretty picture. You just don't turn on a camera and you get lights directly. There are a lot of things happening in that image. This is, this is an actual scan from the Visible Imaging Radiometer Suite or VIRS, which has this nighttime instrument known as the day-night band. And the image is 3,000 kilometers in, in along the scan direction. And this image is a granule of roughly five minutes. And this is, of course, an image of um, India. And you can see the, the border between India and Pakistan right here. And roughly about 
2% of the Earth's land mass is classified as urban. That means is that we have, using Landsat, remember the image of Las Vegas, if you count the number of buildings and infrastructure, about roughly only 2% of the total land mass, all deserts, you know, um, trees, is urban. But this is not urbanization, this is energy. And it's showing you settlements outside of urban areas. Just so you know, not everybody lives inside a building in this planet. Some people live in rural settlements. Some people live in dis internally displayed settlements. And the value of the black marble is it allows you to really measure human presence, not directly related to infrastructure, but related to humanity. So if you take an image like this, which is one single tile of one orbit, and you combine 5,000 plus orbits, you collect enough data to create the black marble on an annual basis. And that's roughly 44, 42 terabytes. If you were doing this back in the 70s, you'd have to have the entire holdings in the Library of Congress times four just to make this map. That's how much data we're talking about. And the challenge doesn't stop there. The, the NASA program wants to use these measurements on a daily basis and at very fine resolution. That's the challenge. So how do we go about doing that? Well, we need to contend with all the issues surrounding the collection of images at night. And that's the fact that there are many, many, many different other sources of light emissions that also impact our ability to estimate lights coming from cities. And if you're an atmospheric scientist or you want to study the Earth's heliosphere, this is really, really awesome because now this is a new source so that you can detect the aurora. You can measure concentration of particles like night glow. But if you're a scientist just studying human settlements, all this is noise. And so I'm going to go through a few of these. The biggest source of contamination in nighttime data is the moon. You can see here that the moon can reflect from the Earth's surface, and the surface is very variable, like in this case, desert is very stable, so it, does, it stays very stable. You can constrain that the amount of light coming from the moon versus light coming from cities very easily. But as soon as you go to another place, like here, this is, you know, this is vegetation in the, you know, the horn, around the Horn of Africa, that is changing. So there are many dynamics. There's a confluence of issues associated with estimating night lights from space, being that we have multiple emission sources. We have the moon and we have other sources, as I'll, I'll show you. We have snow. Snow is very bright. And if you go, like, if you look at like, cities like Toronto or Montreal and Quebec, it looks as, as bigger as New York City, but it's not, it's not really, the extent is not real. It's just a physical property known as snow multiple scattering. And by the way, I'm putting all these books here describing the principles behind how we map all these different characteristics from space. And it's very important for us to characterize snow because 25% of human settlements exhibit some kind of snowfall throughout the year. And so if you really want to get a, a clean map on a daily basis, you got to measure the snow. You also have to measure this thing known as the atmosphere, which is in the middle between you and the city. And especially if the atmosphere becomes turbid as a result of natural variations like fires. So these are, these are fi fires taking place in Siberia as measured from the MODIS sensor on, on Terra. And you can see them in here in red dots. And then here are fires at night. It's almost like we have an X-ray vision. And we can see the actual burn scar of the fires. And of course, fires are in places where people live. So you have to also separate fires between cities and other, other areas. Here's another emission source, air glow in Aurora. Let's see if this one works.
So the last issue I want to talk about is vegetation. If you study cities, you have to study vegetation, Be not only because lights have to penetrate vegetation in order to be detected, but also vegetation is important. It helps mediate ecosystem <laughs> services and function. And unless you're like, you know, hanging out with eagles on the first moon of Endor, most most human settlements are in the ground, and. And so we have to develop models that describe how light passes through a forest canopy. In other words, it's important to study urban infrastructure, but you also have to study forest urban structure. All right, so you do all these things, and, you, and, and the takeaway being you have to combine all these measurements. It's not enough just to take nighttime images. You need to understand what's going on during daytime, so that you can characterize the vegetation, the earth's reflectivity, et cetera. And you can do things like this to see the raw image. This is Paris at night. And this is a French countryside. You can detect where the clouds are, where the aerosol is, where the snow is. This is, this is the Alps. This is the Pyrenees. This is how much reflections we are to expect. And these areas in green here are areas where we're seeing foliage, and there's light out below the foliage. And what happens is basically, if you don't correct for this, the entire French countryside disappears during the summer. And I know part of that is because French people take longer vacations than Americans, <laughs> but it's also because there's vegetation structure that you need to account for. All right, so here's the final image. And so there you go. From a daytime image, raw, to a daytime black marble image. So the pictures you, you see in, in, in the front are annual. This is daytime. Now I can show you how it lies from space because now we can we broke break through that issue, and so here's here's an image of the DC area, and now we have these daily images. We can start slicing them by season, and what you see here is a seasonal change in nighttime light. So that means that we're comparing the amount of lighting that we see during the holiday period relative to the rest of the year. Anywhere you see green, you're seeing an increase in lighting of roughly 20 to 30 percent. Notice that the entire area around Congress is red because <laughs> it's they're out of session. You know, hopefully they pass their tax plan before Christmas. They'll also be able to um, go back in red. But notice that pretty much all Fairfax County, or Arlington County, all Howard County in green, and everywhere you see green there, you're seeing Christmas lights from space. And so, and I hope that I've impressed upon you, and I know it became a little, you know, technical at the front that I showed you that lamp in Puerto Rico, but I hope that you believe me that if we can detect a, a, a lamp like that, that we can detect Christmas lights. But the question is, what does it mean? Here's, here's Baltimore area. Notice that unlike D.C., which has a much more commercial and federal workforce that disappears during the holiday, you know, we, we have a lot more green inside the densely populated residential areas. There's also an issue of space. If in the suburbs, people have larger areas to provision lights, whereas in the more densely populated areas, the amount of light that you can put is just so much because there's not enough space. And so the reason why this is important is because it's, a, it's because of the topic of energy. These measurements are allowing us to map cities not just as a function of their size, their density, but as a function of energy behaviors. Behaviors that are driven by a status, a, a behaviors that are driven by the values of a culture. We can see culture from space. And in the case of the United States, we can see Christmas lights everywhere, meaning that whether you're rich or poor, religious or not, everybody celebrates the holidays. And what we know is that it's the the process is short term and it's shifted, meaning that people live, people leave their offices and they go and stay with their, in their homes with their families. So it's, a, it's an energy increase, but it's also shifts in location. And when we did research across other cultures, we found that the energy signature is very different from that of Christmas. Like if we go here to, now this is, this is the Middle East, this is near Mecca, and I'm gonna concentrate on this rock from here, you, you can see here. And again, I, we can measure 
small pixels on a daily basis. So you can get images like these. So this is raw data, monthly, and daily products, and they're all following a similar trend. But notice the reoccurring pattern of the holiday. And of course, the holiday that we're seeing here is not Christmas, but it's the Hajj. This is Mount Arafat. And in Mount Arafat, Muslims come together, roughly about two, up to 10 million um, pilgrims come and pray in Mount Arafat, and they stay here in these camps. They, this is known as the city of air-conditioned tents. This is the city of Mina. And every one of these tents has an air-conditioned unit. That is not the, your grandpa's way of doing you know, the Hajj. This is, this is the new way of doing the Hajj. And we also see the same effect during Ramadan. But remember, the change in energy use is different. People are not moving during these periods. They're staying where they are, and they're moving, they're shifting all their energy use at night. And that's a different so sociocultural construct because what we've learned is that there's a portion of the energy that humans use that is related to individual behavior and decision making. What kind of car do you drive? How big your house is? You know, what do you define as comfort? Is it a 2,000 square room house or is it 4,000? But there's also a portion of the energy that we use that is related to the energy required to live within a certain cultural context. When and how much people use energy is dictated by the society in which we live and the routines of that society. And this is really important in the context of global energy policy because there's a lot of savings that we can gain, not just by looking at individual incentives like how much tax I'm going to put on carbon or how, you know, how much I'm going to tax for an SUV, but looking at community-wide energy use. All right, so this is another study where we conducted where we looked at the clustering of different voting districts in Egypt during Ramadan. And as you can see here, this is before Ramadan. During Ramadan, it peaks during the age, the end of Ramadan, and again, it goes down. The difference between these three groupings is that these are rich people, these are moderate you know, income people, and then these are poor districts. So even within the same religion, energy is being used differently because some people have more access to energy and services. This is an issue of inequality. This is also an issue of religious backing because folks that are rich are also tend to be less pious. You know, they, or they're, you know, they don't follow the full teachings of, of Islam. And, but what's, what is common across all of them is that everybody celebrates. Everybody must and is obligated to celebrate during the aid. So, this is showing us that we're really looking at cultural boundaries, even within the same culture. So that pretty much goes into the holiday light feature. And the last, this was two years ago. In the last two years, we've been exploring other methods in which we can use these measurements to also study humanity in new ways, especially in the context of the United Nations Agenda of 2030 for Sustainable Development Goals. And I'm going to go through three different examples uh, where we are using these measurements to assess some of these sustainable development goals so as we know them SDGs. So this is goal seven, which is to ensure access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all, which is bring electricity to Africa. That's, wh that's what it means. And what it means is also that by bringing electricity, we're also helping address some of the issues that we have in terms of air quality, in terms of energy access for children who can't study at night because they don't have access to electricity, but especially on, on how we examine routines for shifting energies to a more sustainable fashion because the way cooking is done in Africa really oftentimes relies on really dirty sources of fuel um, like wood and carbon and dung and you know byproducts from farmland. And of course, that crosses all of our quality issues. And, and so the point, the point of the goals is to be able to tackle and trace progress along a number of indicators. And in, the, in this case, looking at night lights uh, to address how, how that is being done. And so here's a, the other issue with energy is also we're trying to figure out how to electrify an entire continent. And we haven't yet to decide what's the proper mix between a centralized electrical grid where power is coming in from a large turbine and into small 
sectors. But in, in case of Africa, powering that last mile is really hard and you really have to be off the grid and use distributed systems. And so here's an example of how we can do. This is the city of Corhogo in Ivory, in Ivory Coast. And you can see that on a daily basis, we know the exact timing of where the electrification took place. And we compare these with records from the World Bank and the energy ministries, and we, we managed to find objectively whether the, the programs that are electrifying these communities are working. You're spending $400 million a year on electrification. Most of it, hopefully, will go to address the needs of these communities. Some of them will be wasted. And it's going to be in the interest of everybody to sh ensure that we can effectively assess progress. The same goes with what happens when you're not looking at sustainability, but also looking at resilience, building a power system that lasts through extreme weather events. And that's the case of Puerto Rico, where we've had, we've released maps that also show us the impacts immediately following Maria. So these are maps that we released and we've been working with FEMA, the Army National Guard and the Coast Guard, we show the aftermath of, of Maria. And you'll see the slider coming in now. And this was immediately three days after. And because we have these long-term measurements, we can't, we don't stop just the three days after, we can keep looking further Um, further and further into time, 13 days after, 70 days after. And because we're looking at lighting, we're looking at a different metric compared to what is being reported by the government, which is total power uh, amount that's coming in from, from the transmission lines, which does not give you any information about who actually has electricity right now. And so what we've been able to do is to study outdoor lighting versus the percent number of houses with electricity, which again, it's only the count of total amount of megawatt hours that are being produced. Whether they are making it back to the end point, we don't know. And what we argue is that the residual between these tell you those folks who have diesel power generators. Because they're off the grid, and so you can start looking at energy access in a much more broader holistic way, not just looking at one system, but looking at the entire system as a whole. The other thing that we also can trace is inequality, especially in the context of the modernization of the energy sector globally. If even after, let's say like we decide to spend $1 trillion in solar panels tomorrow, we're still gonna have issues because we still have a path dependence of communities which for ages, for generations, have only done this, mine coal. And you don't have to go to China. You can just go two hours from here and you know what I'm talking about. And the issue there is that what happens when there's a policy enacted to lay off 1.2 million Chinese workers in the district of Shenmu? Well, this is what happens. It looks like a disaster. It looks like just like Puerto Rico. And there wasn't a disaster. The disaster really is an economic trend of deurbanization associated with a sector that has been wiped out from the map. And humanity has gone through these upswings many, many different times. There's within in, you know, evolved from the Stone Age because we ran out of rocks. We, we evolved because, I know, it's because we evolved from coal to more modernized means. So we have to see this as a positive, but also we need to see the energy policy in a, in, a, in, a, in a community context because there's people who are being impacted as a result of these changes in modernization. And finally, the, the other thing I want to talk about is that what happens when this happens? You get 1.2 million coal miners showing up in all your cities looking for jobs. That's what's going to happen. Massive migration of workers. And there's one place where that happens, and then suddenly you get contagion, which in, in disaster reduction we call, you know, you want to prevent regional instability because that is going to affect your, the central cities that drive the economy of the country. And if there's one place where that has already happened, it's Syria. The issue of, of Syria has a lot, I mean, it's, it's a very complicated story, but the main issue that we see is that when the energy sector went bust in 2008, and all the fields, all the winter wheat fields that were dependent on water and pumps started to crash, you started seeing all these farmers coming into the cities. And that just created the right 
recipe for ISIS to take over. And so here's another. We have an, uh, a video that we did with our colleagues um, at the BBC. جبنا كاسة منحط يا عدس ويا رز هدول اثنين بس بصيروا قبل ما تحطي رز بتجيبي قطعة قطنية تكون قماش لون أبيض بتحطي أول شيء قطعة القماش هيك طويلة ومنحط فوق منها منكبسها شوي ومنحط فوق منها زيت زيت الزيتون هل بهالطريقة بتشتغل وبطول يعني هلا بهالطريقة بجوز يطول أربع ساعات خمس ساعات يشتغل هذا I'll show you a snapshot of this one district in, in Aleppo, and this is how it looks. And it's, I've, I've shown these to economists, and it's like, you're, you're like monitoring the EKG of a city. That's really what you're doing. You're monitoring, I mean, the buildings are still there and destroyed, but if the people aren't there, the next question is, where are they going, and where are they coming back? And I can tell you where some of them are going, they're going around different countries and they're setting up shop in all these internally displaced settlements. This is the largest settlement in, in, in Jordan, uh, the, the Satari ref refugee camp. And as you can see, right in 2012, you know, this, this town of 20,000 people needed to accommodate 200,000 refugees. And these are really tough camps. This, there's no electricity and there's just tents thousands of them. And we can see that in the data because all these swings are related to weather patterns where there's flooding, constant flooding taking place, and the relief workers have a hard time bringing in more people because they have to you know, clean up and bring back. Um, the United Arab Emirates contributed a new camp just 40 kilometers away. It's called the Emirati camp, and you can see these are in containers. Um, and, but they can only accommodate up to 5,000 people. This is how it looks uh, from Google Earth. And of course, people are coming back. This is the town of Yarabalus, which was taken over uh, by al-Shabaab, and the, the, Syri the Free Syrian Army was backed by the Turkish government to take over in 2016. And this is what happens when 20,000 people show, come back. So you, you can see, um, this is the Euphrates, so it's, pr it's a pretty it's right in the corner where Turkey, so it's a, a, an area where ISIS could not uh, really stay for a long time. <coughs> All right, so that's, this is where we are with, with the black marble right now. We have a massive amount of data, and it's giving us really rich information about the human condition. And it's helping us define our communities, not just as places where, do you, where you put on a map, but as a process. And it's allowing us to study the confluence of the many different challenges that humanity faces. When you look at climate change, it's not just about climate. It's about urbanization, urban development. It's about energy. And to be able to ensure that every community has a, has a chance to improve their cities in one way or another. No city in this country is sustainable, is resilient, is equitable, and safe. They may be three out of four, they may be three out of, uh, no, I, Vancouver is very pretty, but it's still not sustainable because a lot of the materials that they bring, they bring from China. And so they need to account for materials and everything like that. So what's NASA's role? Well, we don't save lives. That if, if I were to do that, I would be joining the Army Command in Puerto Rico now. Our job is to provide everyone with the data and the tools that they need 
in order to tackle all these problems, it, it, in order to push the technology in a way that we can really turn this into societal benefit for everyone. And that's it. That's my talk. Thank you so much. Go ahead, we'll try the one. Okay, so I, 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 now that you have the data created or you're creating this data, who do you see as being your major consumer of this data? There are three consumers that we're targeting and we're already collaborating with. Uh, one of them are economists and demographers who are trying to study, who are trying to come up with economic statistics in areas where there's absolutely no data. Think, I mean, it, we, we have so much data on, on d like labor rates and everything in the U.S. that adding lights, it doesn't add more value. It doesn't improve your statistics. But when you go to a place like Ivory Coast, you know, having this information really adds value in terms of understanding trends, understanding demographic changes, and doing it in a way that's new, not like doing like a census map every 10 years, but monitoring humanity in real time using social media and using a combination of data sets. The second area is disaster response. FEMA already is obsessed with this data. And, and they, see it, they see it as a new changing game technology, nothing that they're using operationally yet, but they want to get this in a more mature way so that they can get measurements from anywhere in the United States, anywhere in the world within three hours. So that's a separate community. And the third community, of course, is the energy community. We want to be able to trust and verify any efforts to restore power, let's say in Puerto Rico, and to be able to say, well, there's only 3%, you know, 75% of people should have power. There's a should versus there's half, actually. And to be able to provide an objective means to track progress is also very powerful. So those are the three, three main ones. All right, so let me introduce you to my team. Josen, can you? That's our team. He's, it's him and me. <laughs> so I'm the guy that does all the advertising, and he's the mastermind behind the Black Marble. He does all the coding. And there's Jessica Seppersad, who's our coordinator for disaster. So we also engage with all different parts of members of uh, the headquarters program across different missions. We have, and we're hopefully recruiting a new programmer. That's it. That's our team. We have to do the science, the data crunching, and we need to tell you a story of why it matters. And we're lean and mean at NASA because it's very competitive. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Will this data ever get compared with um, you know, the, the other um, searches for um, SETI and intelligent life? Will what you see in terms of lights here ever be analyzed in a way that might be used? So. To analyze, let's say, let's see, let's say there's a, let's, let's ponder if there's going to be like a UFO and it's just going around at night. Can we detect that? Probably not. Because if it's moving too fast, we actually had a, an activation through disasters to, to see, to answer the question, can you capture MH370, the Malaysian airline in that, that was lost and was found in reunion? And we were like honing over the entire Indian Ocean, trying to find the smallest area. And we found this tiny little spot. It's like, this must be it. But then our colleagues had not confirmed that it was the condensation trail of a meteor. I was like, oh, OK, well, at least we can see a meteor. That's fun. We can also see other satellites going through, because we're, we're up at 833 kilometers. So once in a while, there's a satellite going behind us, on top of us. And we're seeing a satellite. And it's like, get out of the way. I'm measuring the Earth. <laughs> so we can see things moving. Well, if that's alien life, I, I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, we, we, but it was, this sensor was not designed to measure holy lights from space. It's just that American engineering is that good that we managed to get that much sensitivity. But the program didn't design this to do this, you know. It's, that's, that's how NASA works. It's like, whoops. Oh, yeah, you can measure humanity. Okay, cool. But it's really, it, this is a NOAA instrument that was designed to measure extreme weather events in Alaska because we have geosynchronous satellites and Alaska is right in the corner and they don't have really good maps. 
So we we came up with the night this night vision mask so that we can look at, you know, sea ice and and all these other aspects. And by accident, NASA is also having fun with the data and doing all these signs. But that's how it works. So if you see a lightning stripe, uh, we basically say we, we couldn't see anything that day because a lightning stripe would saturate that image to the point that we, it cannot be corrected. However, if it's aerosol, we can use radiated transfer techniques. We can study, look that book of aerosols and study how much light interacts with aerosols and we can really pin down the uncertainty and the error there. If it's clouds, probably we're going to say we didn't detect anything that day. And so what we do is we go back to the clearest, best day that possible, and we report as this is not today, but this is what we got yesterday. If, if that works you know, for you, that's fine. Uh, but if you're detecting out, you just want to have a clear shot. But that's really hard over the Caribbean where there's so many clouds. So you have to really build your confidence. And that's the uniqueness of having a polar orbiting sensor where you're visiting Puerto Rico every night, and you can really build a large record over time to really ram down the uncertainties. So depending on the phenomenon, sometimes we give up and sometimes we say, actually, we can, let's use these models to then describe what is actually being seen that's only human driven. Yes. Yes. Roughly 40 to 60 percent of of light will actually pass through aerosols depending on the sphericity and the size distribution of that aerosol. It could be dust from the Sahara, it could be fire and smoke, and we, because we have daytime measurements that really accurately measure those particles, we make some assumptions of what happens between the day and night, about the focal chemistry, because everything's changing at night when, when the sun's out, and Jose and I have built models to really um, constrain the errors there. It's a big problem, and it, we're really starting to really explore aerosol retrievals at night. Um, so yeah, that's for like the next generation. Does the Department of Defense have any interest in looking at, say, North Korea? <laughs> the Department of Defense likely has an even much broader and more refined measurement than these, where they can even get a, an even finer resolution directly. Um, the, I think the. The Air Force Weather Agency also has a lot of interest because there's phenomena where you have to secure uh, an accurate forecast when troops are going through oceans and everything. So yeah, there. And in fact, the first generation nighttime sensor was from from the DoD. So this is a DoD heritage sensor. And I think you had one more. Um, in terms of energy consumption, will there come a time when the the increasing use of LEDs or other much more energy efficient sources of light impact on how you have to deal with this data? And, you know, is yeah. that in the near future or is that like... So there, there's two issues with LEDs and one of them is that the, the eyes of my, the sensor that measures the air at night they can't see blue and LEDs have a lot of blue on them. You, you may not see it but they combine a lot of blue. No, don't see them because then you'll saturate. Um, and so if you look at the wavelength in the electromagnetic spectrum, blue is high at 480 nanometers. This sensor's shortest wavelength is 500, which is green, meaning that we can't detect LEDs. But LEDs also have a lot of information in, in the green, in the red, but most of there's a huge pump in the blue that we cannot detect. So meaning that from year to year, if someone switches lights, Using this sensor, we cannot detect an LED change. What we can detect is improved methods for abatement of light pollution. So if you use a full cutoff light instead of putting light contaminating the night sky, which 
you know, messes up all the astronomy and messes up like bird habitats, then we can detect that change because now you're concentrating the light to the surface. And so you're going to see a downward trend. But we, unless you give me $200 million and I put another sensor in the eye, International Space Station, which we, we could do, um, we can't detect the LEDs. It's, it's a really small signal. In in fact, yes. In fact, if you use the 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 OMI and the records from the early 1990s, we are already seeing, which is good news, that an overall uh, negative trend in in short-lived gases in, across the United States, especially in California, a lot of smog has finally started to ramp down, but it's also an issue of mountain meteorology and all these other issues associated with it. And so, yeah, we can detect long-term trends, and as we add more instruments that measure ozone, that measures plumes, uh, we can also start characterizing aerosols for very long periods of time. The, the value that nighttime images provide in that context is that we can measure optical properties at night, which no other sensor can do. At night, oftentimes, you just rely on the thermal data to detect fires and clouds. But finally, we can also detect optical properties, and that means that we can build a more complete record because oftentimes you get clouds, and then suddenly you need to look at the interaction between clouds and aerosols, and that becomes difficult. And, so, and this is very early uh, work um, that started at NASA and NOAA. And you usually need like a 30, 40 year record to really start seeing a trend. And this is just five years, so I'll make that clear. But you can start seeing a lot of typologies. You can start seeing cities grow and everything. All right? Thank you. Thank you all for coming. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.